mother gets our clothes all pressed, the kids are getting dressed upstairs. Sunday morning, time for church. All our neighbors know we've got the best church around. Our church, in the middle of our street. Our church, in the middle of our... Our church, it has a crowd. There's always something happening. In preparing this time of worship, I've just been thinking about Jesus's encounter with the folk that he met. And often we hear him meeting people in the street, in the villages, and often in their own homes. It's very, very rare that we hear of Jesus's encounter with people in the synagogues or in the temple in Jerusalem, more often than not, he was out where people were. And when he spoke to people and told them about the kingdom of God and how much God loves them, he didn't say to them, well, I'm not going to talk about God now or a relationship with God. You come and see me on Saturday at the synagogue. Or you come to me when the festivals are on in Jerusalem. No, he didn't. He spoke about God, his heavenly father, where he was in the situations that he found himself in. And so it is, it's just reminded me of that more strongly in this time of lockdown, in this time of separation, that we are in our own homes and in our own situations. But Jesus is still there. To meet us in the places that we are in. And so we gather in our homes, ready to focus totally on God, our Heavenly Father. Help us to be brave enough, like Peter. Peter, the disciple who was often brave enough, not just like in last week's uh, Gospel reading, to step out of the boat. But Peter was also brave enough to ask questions, even uh, make statements, sometimes getting it very right, but often getting it wrong. But it didn't stop him from asking questions. Sometimes we are not brave enough to ask questions about our faith, about God, about the scriptures. We're not brave enough because we don't want to look the odd one out. We don't want to look silly or stupid in front of others. 
well, we don't want to seem that we have got a lack of faith. But this is the way we grow, by asking questions. And so Peter is a good example of that. And so help us to be brave, like Peter, to ask the questions that we would like to ask and be open enough to hear God's answer to us. In our worship today, Heavenly Father, speak to us and help us to have a listening ear, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And we continue in prayer. Lord God, as we come before you now, we open our hearts to you. Help us to see that we can learn so much from others, even from those whom we think we are not alike whom we don't share anything in common. Make us willing to stand out from the crowd, to hear your voice and to act upon it. We say this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to share some words and music now from Singing the Faith and uh, Come now is the time for worship. Now is the time to bow down before God and worship you. A moment of quietness as we reflect on those words and as we come with our prayers of confession asking God to forgive us the things that we are conscious of and also of course the things that uh, we haven't realized when we've uh, strayed from God's perfect image so just a moment of quietness and then we're going to have our prayers of confession and there's a response when I say forgive us Lord responses for missed opportunities. Forgive us Lord, 
and the response for missed opportunities. Lord, sometimes we look as though we are listening to others. We may even make all the right noises, but we confess that our attitude is often anywhere but where it is supposed to be. Forgive us, Lord, for missed opportunities. Sometimes we are too distracted by our own concerns. We care only for ourselves and listen only to those who say what we want to hear. Forgive us, Lord, for missed opportunities. Sometimes we don't listen to people because we don't like them or because they are different from us. Sometimes we have bad or unhelpful thoughts. Forgive us, Lord, for missed opportunities. Sometimes we don't listen to you, Lord, because we are too busy or a bit frightened about what you might say to us. Forgive us, Lord, for missed opportunities. Lord God, we thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that you are a caring God. And we thank you that you are a forgiving God. And you run to meet us with open arms to love, to forgive, and make us new. In Christ's name. Amen. Over the last few weeks, our lectionary readings have been about Jesus' identity, who he is, and people trying to work out who Jesus really is. And not just the disciples, but other people too. The people in the crowd at the feeding of the multitude. The disciples in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm. Who said you could be here? <laughs> Scuffy. Scuffy. Get, get out of the way of the camera. Why am I talking to the computer? Because there's no one there. <laughs> well, well, Scuffy. In these times of lockdown, I'm talking to the computer because I'm hoping that somebody will be there listening. No, you can't, Scuffy. Scuffy, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't see them. No, you won't be able to see them. You've just got to believe that somebody's there. If no one is there, then I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I don't think that's very funny, Scruffy. Did I know that there's no cats in the Bible? Yes, I, 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 I do know that. Yes, yeah, but, but there's dogs, yes. Dogs are mentioned in the Bible. Um, at least, at least uh, 29 times. So that's a good thing. Well, 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 possibly, possibly. So, should we look up some of the passages that uh, dogs are mentioned in? Yeah, hang on then. Right, what should we look at? Should we look at? We we'll look at the New Testament, shall we? The Gospels. Okay. All right. So in Matthew. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I'll read it because even I'm a better reader than you. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. 
you won't get any doggy treats if you don't let me read this. You were the one who started this conversation, weren't you? Okay. Yep. Go on then, otherwise no walkies. Right, so behave. Matthew 7 verse 6 says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. You don't like that one. Okay, let's try, let's try one of Paul's letters. Right, yeah, are you, are you listening? Right, good, I'm, I'm pleased that you're listening, aren't you? Yes. So, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the wrongdoers. Look out for those who manipulate the flesh. You don't like that one either. Let's have a look then at the Old Testament. Yeah? Okay. From the first book of Kings 14. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city the dogs shall eat them. You're not going to eat anybody. I'm, I'm glad to hear it, Scruffy. Right. Okay. Is that enough? You want to hear a nice one? How about how about the Psalms? Okay, all right then, let's go for the Psalms. I hope you're sitting still and not fidgeting. Right, don't fidget then. You promised me not to fidget. The dogs encompass me, a company of evil doers encircle me. You don't like that one either. One more then. One more. See if we can find a good one. This is from Proverbs. That's uh, wise. That's wise sayings, Scruffy. I don't know whether you know much about wise sayings. Proverbs twenty six. Like a dog that returns to his vomit, is a fool who repeated. His follies, like a dog who returns to his vomit, is like a fool who repeats his follies. They're just getting worse and worse. <laughs> well, yes, I suppose so. It's because that in, in biblical times, dogs weren't seen as, as loving pets like you. Yeah, yeah, see, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know you, I know you love scuffing. I know. It's a little bit hot in this fur coat. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. It's hot in this white jacket too. Yeah, in biblical times, people didn't like dogs. They thought that they were sort of um, scavengers and uh, and you know to be put in the same places as evil doers and just greedy. You're not greedy, are you, Scruffy? <laughs> you are. Okay, but in today's um, reading that we're going to hear in a minute, Peter's going to share our, our gospel reading that talks about dogs. And when we realise that uh, in the Bibles, dogs are talked about in a not very nice way, it helps us understand this Bible reading better. You can stay around to listen to that. No, are you sure? Go on, stay around and listen. You still want to see the people out there. Have a good look then. See if you can see anybody. There's someone sitting there having a cup of tea. Well, good for them. Good for them. Yeah. All right then. Okay, in the meantime, you can go back in your bag, can't you? Like a good dog. Yeah, you're going to be a good dog. 
Yeah. We're going to be a good dog. Okay then. So, bye bye, Scruffy. All right. See you later. Bye for now. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offence when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach, and, what go and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy upon me, Lord, O son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for as you wish. And she and her daughter was healed instantly. In today's passage, those uh, opening verses 10 to 20 are in brackets. And uh, I suppose they're in brackets so that uh, if you want to, you can leave them out. And I'm sure that many preachers will. But there is a link between the two encounters that Jesus has, first with the Pharisees and then with the Canaanite woman. They're both sort of linked by food in a in a metaphorical way but in fact there is a deeper link faith and membership of God's people and the outcome of the encounters is something that we are surprised about I'm sure that uh, many of us grew up in uh, going to Sunday school. I'm sure not everybody, but uh, many of us did. And the Sunday school that I went to back in Portsmouth, there uh, on the, the wall was a picture. And I'm sure this picture featured in many Sunday schools and many churches of that era, mid 20th century era of Jesus surrounded by different children from all over the world. And as I sat in Sunday school, I would gaze up at this picture and uh, place myself in the picture. There was a, uh, a little blonde girl with a little blue dress. And so I imagined that that was me. But uh, as I said, there was other children there in their traditional native costumes. And maybe not so PC in our 21st century. But we get the impression of Jesus meek and mild. Jesus died for all the children. And Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
But in this passage, we meet a slightly different Jesus, a Jesus that we are surprised about, a Jesus that uh, comes over probably a little bit belligerent and a little bit less than loving and caring and meek and mild. Jesus had travelled into Gentile territory. He was uh, he'd lost, uh, he'd left behind the uh, Jewish territory, and so being in Gentile territory, it was probably quite unsurprising that he met this woman who wasn't Jewish, this Canaanite woman, and yet. It seems that he was unprepared for who he met. Here she is, begging people, begging the disciples and begging Jesus in particular. In her begging, she bows down to Jesus, which is why I chose the opening worship song about bowing down to worship God. There are many times in the Bible when we hear about people bowing down to worship. In the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we have the Magi bowing down to Jesus as they meet him as a small child, recognising his kingship, recognising his power. There's the story of the lepers bowing down to Jesus. The leader who wanted Jesus to heal his daughter, he bows down, recognising Jesus' power and authority. And so this Canaanite woman recognises who Jesus is, probably even more so than some others. Yes, the disciples uh, saw that Jesus had the power and authority when he calmed the storm and in the midst of the storm and in the midst of their anxiety, their worry and their concern about their life, they recognise who Jesus is. But then in the everydayness of their life with Jesus, they put that to one side again. And how often do we do that in the midst of our storm, in the midst of our concerns and anxiety? We turn to Christ on bended knee or even metaphorical bended knee to worship him and uh, feel his power and his authority. And then in everyday life, we can once again forget that. So in this encounter, this woman is not only um, female, females didn't talk to males in first century times, and particularly approaching a teacher, a rabbi, as she did. It's a bit like the woman at the well. It's a surprising encounter. And to start with, Jesus doesn't even answer her. He totally blanks her. And it's the disciples who say, come on, come on, Jesus, tell her to go away. Tell her to shut up and leave us alone. But Jesus almost uses this as um, a living parable to teach the disciples a lesson. Many of people, many commentaries have tried to um, answer why Jesus is... Um, perceived as being so uncaring to this woman. Is, she trying to, is he trying to teach the woman a lesson? Or is he trying to teach us a lesson, or at least those disciples? As the woman, does the woman change Jesus' mind? That's all of that that has been spoken about through the centuries as preachers and teachers grapple with this uncharacteristic view of Christ. The great commentaries of the 21st century and indeed the mid-20th century, and as I think of the commentators of 
the mid 20th century, I think of William Barclay. I was actually telling someone just before lockdown that in the move from Chichester to Christchurch, I got rid of all my Barclay commentaries. Uh, one reason being that back when I was at theological college, we were told not to read any commentaries that were written and compiled before 1972 because they were now deemed as out of date. So some of you might feel that I'm committing heresy by not quoting Barclay. And in fact, I remember back when I did have my Barclay commentaries on my shelf that uh, if I still had them today and looked up this particular passage, he said, oh, Jesus wasn't calling this woman a dog. Jesus was calling her a pet puppy. There, there, how cute and cuddly. No, he wasn't. He was calling her a dog, a derogatory term, just as uh, Scruffy and I looked at those passages earlier. Dogs were considered dirty animals, not unclean, not unclean, but animals that were with wrongdoers, animals that would lick your wounds and eat your flesh animals that would eat their own vomit. They weren't considered as pets. They weren't considered cute and cuddly. And so Jesus here is insulting this woman by calling her a dog. Why does he do that? People have asked that through the ages. Hence, this first, this, the first passages of this reading does link in. Jesus says it's what comes out of a person's mouth that speaks, that shows, that demonstrates their true heart. This woman had obviously heard about Jesus. Somehow his teaching and his healing and his preaching had got beyond the Jewish boundaries. As I said, here he is in Gentile territory. She might have wanted to just jump on the bandwagon of what she'd heard. She might have wanted to jump on the bandwagon of what she heard. But I put her in the same category as the centurion, centurion who wanted his servant healed. And he knew that Jesus didn't have to visit or physically see his servant to heal him. Just say the word, just say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. Jesus then commends him of his great faith. Here too, this Canaanite woman knows that she doesn't have to receive much from Jesus. All she has to do is to receive a crumb. In saying that, Jesus knew that she had got the truth. She had understood better than the disciples who still, including Peter, had to ask more questions. In those verses from 10 to 20, Jesus turns around to Peter and says, don't tell me, don't tell me that even, even you, even you who came and experienced that time out of the boat, even you still don't get it, Peter. But here we have this Canaanite woman who knows that even the crumbs are good enough. Even the crumbs will heal her daughter. No wonder Jesus knew that this encounter was worth 
healing her daughter. She just wasn't someone who was jumping on the bandwagon. She wasn't just someone who wanted to take and take and take. Over the years, I've met many people who have spoken about what the church should be doing for them. What good the church should be showing them. What pastoral concerns the church should or hasn't shown them. This also reminds me of the President of the United States, Kennedy. And yes, I confess that I'm too young to remember what I was doing when Kennedy was shot. But he did have those faithful words, didn't he? Ask not what the country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And it's the same for us. Ask not what our church can do for you, but what can you do for your church? Here this woman knew that it was just the crumbs. It also speaks about having faith as small as a mustard seed. Another type of small crumb that is offered. And so, Jesus declares, what comes out of our mouths shows our true heart. And what came out of the mouth of this Canaanite woman, she recognised what she needed to receive from God. Just a small token. That's all it takes. What small token do you want to receive from God today? We're not looking for large miracles. But God is found in the smallness in the everydayness of our lives. Help us always to remember that and to be thankful as she was thankful. Amen. So we come with our prayers for others and remembering that uh, just a crumb, just a mere morsel is enough for us all. The Canaanite woman sought your help Lord. She loved her daughter so much she was so desperate in need that she, she wouldn't give up until she had an answer. We pray in faith. Hear us and answer our cry. Blessed Lord. Lord May we learn from this woman to wait on you expectantly, patiently, persistently, doggedly. Grant us the courage of our convictions when we truly believe we are doing your will. We pray in faith. Hear us and answer our cry. Blessed Lord. We pray today for those who feel excluded, whatever their situation, whatever the reason, for prisoners, refugees, the homeless, for the sick and the mentally ill, for anyone who feels that they are outsiders. We pray in faith, hear us and answer our cry Blessed Lord, we pray for ourselves when our faith is weak or we feel that we do not belong. We pray in faith, hear us and answer our cry. Blessed Lord, Amen. And we continue with the prayer that Jesus gave us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us 
today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The passage that we've looked at this morning, the beginning where the Pharisees are annoyed with Jesus. They're annoyed because they followed all the rules and regulations and here Jesus is telling them that it's not about that. It's not about what goes in but what comes out of the mouth that's important. What comes out speaks of the heart. This passage is not about Jesus changing his mind. It's not about Jesus learning a lesson. This passage is about faith. The Canaanite woman had faith. She had faith that Jesus had power enough not only for the children of Israel but for her and her daughter. And it shows us that we too need that same faith even though we're not worthy to gather up the crumbs under God's table. The crumbs are enough because God's power is so full and so abundant that the crumbs are all that we need. This woman was persistent in her begging Jesus to ask. She was persuasive too and so we too need to be persistent in our prayers and in our faith. We're going to sing about that faith now. Charles Wesley's words of, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood?
go out today renewed and strengthened in faith, ready to serve you, Lord, and find you in the people we meet. We go out to follow you and our hearts. Lead us, good Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you, with those who you love and those who you ought to love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>